I've made terrible decisions about characters or stuff that I now can't watch the film or yeah. the series because all I see is failure. When I started Jada Bannison, the amount of times that we nearly went bankrupt was crazy. <laughs> and each time you would get closer to it, then you would shift and then something would work. <laughs> Welcome to Esquire Townhouse in your house. I'm Farron Gibson, and today we're here to talk about creativity. I'm joined by the fabulous Josh O'Connor, who is an actor you may recognize from God's Own Country, Netflix's The Crown as Prince Charles, and of course, as a lover of Jane Austen, I have to mention he played Mr. Elton in Emma, the recent adaptation. And I'm also joined by Jonathan Anderson, founder of J.W. Anderson, his own label, and creative director for Louisville. So we're going to have a talk generally about creativity today because I think a lot of people are thinking about picking up creative projects. But before we jump into all of that, I think it would be good to get an understanding of how you guys know each other because you're actually friends. Am I right? Jonathan? Yeah. How do you know each other? We, well, I, I went to see God's in Country. I came out of it and I picked up the phone to um, our casting director and I was just like, we need to get him in a campaign tomorrow. Um, <laughs> So yeah, no, we met because um, we I work with Stephen Meisel, the photographer, and we wanted him to be the face of Blue Up Men. What is it that drew you to him? Was it his look? Was it his acting ability? Some combination? Or I hadn't seen a film that was that good in a long time. I don't know. I, I just I, I went to the Barbican to go see it, and then I came out of it, and I was just like, actually, that feels modern right now mm. and and there was a lot of other films of that period that were trying to do things which were a lot more polished and i kind of liked that it was um, a bit more raw and then that was it and we've been working together ever since the rest is history, <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. i'd love to know how you guys have found your lockdown experience um, as it relates to creativity i mean i spent the whole of lockdown doing gardening which i thought is kind of creative I isn't it yeah yeah. But you were taking photographs of your plants, is that right? I did lots yeah. of photographs of my plants yeah. and got quite into that. Yeah. Um, partly because I was researching. So I, the other thing is that I had this project, which I'm, I've now started on, a film called Mothering Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I had this period of, uh, I kind of privileged to have this period of research time, which is like my favourite bit, really. I found I got in, very into sort of 1920s um, imagery. Um, particularly of plants, kind of prints, a, a lot of etchings yeah, okay. of plants I got really into. Um, but that was more sort of, yeah, I suppose that kind of, that started out as research for this film. Mm -hmm. The film is a kind of, is an adaptation of a novel by Graham Swift. And in the novel, there's a lot of description about orchids and daffodils, hence Mothering Sunday. So, so was it a big change in terms of production? Because did you have plans to shoot anything over the summer? Or... Yeah, we were, I was supposed to be shooting two films during that time, okay. which um, both been pushed. My dream was always to kind of have two or three months before any project to, to fully, um, yeah, sort of fall into a role and get into it and do all the work. Yeah. And that never happens. So you, this the, what, what was your creative experience like? I kind of enjoyed it. I actually kind of liked um, fashion is one of those things that never stops. You're kind of always predicting the future. It was quite nice to actually just think about the present. I, th I felt like I turned into like an HR director. Okay. The <laughs> no. Um, and, no offense to the HR. Um, and it was it was very kind of like it became more of a management role than a creative yeah, role. Yeah. Just to try to keep everything going, but like you were saying, I was doing gardening and trying to do things in the house that I put off. And when you get up at six o'clock in the morning and you're doing Zoom calls all day, your eyes start to, the, the last thing you do is want to do is watch a screen. Yeah. So it was kind of, everything became reversed. It was like, I thought, oh, I'm gonna watch loads of TV series. I didn't, it was more kind of like, I couldn't deal with a digital screen. Yeah. So then I think I started to kind of, I don't know, I think, in a weird way, when you pause creatively, I think you start to change. Like, I, I know that now, after going through it, I, I there's so many things I have changed now. You mean, like, just in terms of aesthetics? Yeah. I'm bored of things. And I feel like oh. it's kind of a good clear out. Or, like, things that I thought were really relevant before, I don't feel are relevant anymore. I noticed some um, brands were pushing designs that looked really good from here up yeah. because people were on video a lot. So does it change the way you think about I your really, design? I, I never worked that way. I kind of always think that, you know, um, 
probably like film, like it's, a, it's about fantasy. You know, like you're trying to get people mm. out of their comfort zone. And I think fashion is a, a very good weapon for that. It's a very good way to kind of, uh, you know, increase endorphins. You know, yeah. you put it on to make yourself feel better. Mm. Okay, are there any things you've kind of decided you quite, quite liked from this experience of being at home more that you're going to carry with you? Spending more time per project and actually really investigating it rather than just doing it on the fly. I'm sure also there are loads of actors who can do that, but I just can't do that. So Fashion week is probably changing a lot the yeah. way that they're doing things. So how do you feel about that, that change of venue in a way that people are experiencing things? I was going to say that Jonathan's show in the box was like, to me, completely brilliant. And I've been to Jonathan's shows and love them. Yeah. And they're always fascinating and beautiful moments of like theatre. But this to me felt like, talking about a kind of lack of tact, kind of tactileness or like anything to do with something that you can literally touch. Yeah. Um, the show in the box was perfect for that. And it felt like something we really needed. So whereas cinema, I think slightly trickier, you know, yes, you can put it on Prime, but it's, it will never be the same experience. We have all been lucky to experience this moment mm. of slowdown, of kind of sharpening the saw a bit. Mm. But I, I would say that the minute that we're allowed to go back. We're allowed to kind of get back to things. I think the great thing about society and the bad thing is that we forget very quickly yeah. um, about what we have learned. But sometimes maybe it becomes part of the, the zeitgeist that there is things that everyone wants to change. Yeah. But I, I think the, the, the speed of creativity, I think, will in a weird way will pick up. I think yeah. sometimes I feel it's actually going to pick up where it left off. But it will. But the landscape will have changed. So I think um, we were just talking about earlier. It's like you know. I, I I think you know there'll be people who I think will just vanish, like relevancy. I think a generation, like older generations, it's going to. It's the pace of things is different yeah. now, and you know in fashion it used to be like we were trying to cultivate millennials. I, I think what I have noticed, which I think is really um, encouraging, mm -hmm. is I think the idea of authenticity has become a really big, big thing, mm -hmm. which has not been there for a while. And I think that's what the millennial generation and the generations that have in common. They want, they want accountability. Um, they want authenticity. It's less about, they, they can't deal with a fraud, you yeah. know? Um, and they want you to be all hanging out, do you know what I mean? It's, it, they want to see all your problems. They want to, you know, and this, it's not like they want a veneer. And I think even Hollywood, when you look at it, especially, you know, with fashion and, uh, and with actors, ultimately has a very close relationship because ultimately they become brand ambassadors. And I think the people that really are uh, popular are people who are very honest, they're yeah. very real. They, That's they, why I love Cardi B. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I do love her. Yeah. yeah. And it's because it's real. Yeah. It's like, and there's no kind of filter. I think they don't want the filter. They want you, they want you to have the same problems. And I think what will be, what was good about the pandemic is everyone had the same problems. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, everyone had probably huge amounts of anxiety. People probably was, you know, it's very worrying for yeah. all demographics of people. Everyone's in the same boat. It's, how we can collectively come out of it and kind of find creativity through it that is going to be long term um, for the next 10 years. The first step is the hardest. You know, when I write, when I sit down to write, the first sentence I write is always the hardest. So I'd be interested to know what you guys do, how you approach a new project or a new line. Like, how do you get yourself going in that creative process? You've talked a little bit about keeping a scrapbook and that sort of thing. Mm, yeah, but the scrapbook is like my, is kind of the only way I can start. Yeah, I suppose if I start with the script, I find it really hard. Yeah, okay. Uh, because I feel no attachment to the story. You know, the story exists in its yeah, kind of from page one to the end. And, and beyond that, I have no idea about it. And so if I start there, I'm very limited. Whereas the, the idea of the scrapbook has always been that I can... If I can create everything outside yeah. the story, everything beyond it and before it, then um, then I have some context. What's really funny about the first page of all my scrapbooks is that they're, if I go back and look now, mm -hmm. they're usually like scratched out or ripped out in another image put in at the end because 
when you start a scrapbook, it often, by the time you've kind of done the journey and created everything else, it's actually totally irrelevant or not helpful or whatever. So for instance, this project, I think my foot, the first image I found that I liked was a photograph of Duncan Grant that I put in. For Mothering Sunday. Uh, yes, yeah. for Mothering Sunday. It was a really beautiful image and he looked so troubled and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And you don't see his eyes and it's kind of everything's lowered. And I love the image and I thought, you know, in terms of finding something that felt relevant to my character, um, this was it. So I put it and it's the front, the front page, you open yeah. the scrapbook. And then I've done all this work, did all this work and went back to the, the beginning and I love the image, but it has no relevance really <laughs> to the rest of the scrapbook. So that's now gone. Sometimes it's helpful to, to kind of bring your own lived experience into a role. Sometimes it's actually really, and I find more exciting to uh, create something from the beginning. In this film, it's a kind of tragedy. This, my character story is a tragedy and I haven't experienced such tragedy in my own life. Well, and so, yeah. luckily, so you create this kind of, this narrative completely yeah. unique to you and no one will ever see it because it's private. And... What about when it's a real person? So yeah. Prince Charles, for example, mm. do, you, do you look at old things? from his life or do you avoid that direction altogether and you go I'm making my own version of him I really avoided yeah. um, the person Prince Charles mm -hmm. um, so firstly I didn't know an awful lot about him um, I don't really follow the royal family uh, I'm an all out republican okay so that's not really changed <laughs> but, in, but also I think what's so attractive about the crown and why I love series one and two is that we are creating a, uh, our own narrative and that's what makes The Crown exciting and interesting is the drama. It's the, the, the same issues we're dealing with in The Crown are, the ex are exactly the same issues as Succession yeah. or Sopranos. And it's basically high family drama. The, the reason Peter Morgan created the, the, the family as being the royal family is that they, uh, they put us in certain places in history and it means you can punctuate the series with a historical event, yeah. which is often the moments where you know, I might like watch some archival footage and, and try and replicate a moment so that people feel safe in the knowledge that we are in yeah. this kind of real world. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the, it's sort of not exciting to me. And plus I'd be rubbish at trying to do an impression or um, uh, a version of Charles that everyone goes, that's exactly him. Uh, I always reference, there was a great film that Todd Haynes made about Bob Dylan mm -hmm. called I'm Not There. And they had eight actors. It was like mm. Heath Ledger and Christian Bale and Kate Blanchett. Yeah, that was amazing. And yeah, and Kate Blanchett, everyone really, everyone remembers Kate Blanchett yeah. because she played the most recognizable version of Dylan. But what I always really loved about it is that there's eight actors playing eight aspects of Dylan's personality. And that's so much more interesting to me than seeing a version of Dylan which, which is literally the only the version of Dylan that we see through the eyes of the press and the media. The young boy in, Dylan, in the Dylan film plays the kind of Woody Guthrie-inspired Woody Guthrie Dylan. And we have no idea what Dylan's like, you know, as a child or what that aspect of his personality is like. And so this gives you a total, a, you know, completely new insight. So with JWS and Oluwebe, when you sit down and you go, right, fall 2020, which we, I guess you thought about that last year, maybe, or earlier this <laughs> year, but anyway. <laughs> Um, how do you how do you get the first thought going? You know, what what's the first step towards getting it done? I we we, we usually start off with a kickoff, which is just kind of where we put anything I've seen along the last couple of months into kind of a pot. It doesn't really make any sense. It's just really kind of I I need to kind of like hone the character into a domestic landscape. So it'll be, it might be an artist, it might be furniture, it might be all the different things around that character. So what would they be into this season? They might be into this, this, and this. You know, iPhone collections where it might be that I don't like the character, and then it might be then all about fabrics I don't like. So corduroy, for oh, example. I, I remember doing a collection which was um, based on Graham Sutherland, the painter. I, I watched a documentary where on Churchill and Churchill, he painted a portrait of Churchill and then he didn't like it. And he was actually an amazing painter of like kind of like trees, a bit like Paul Nash. Um, and so I wanted all this like things that looked like roots. Mm -hmm. So I did all these skirts and things and I, um, I wanted to use corduroy because it was something that I've 
a have like a kind of weird phobia with. So then, is it a textural thing? Or? It's a textural thing, yeah. and I just think sometimes I always feel like sometimes it would it kind of like pills and it kind of like falls off. Yeah, it kind of yeah, looks yeah. a bit mangy. Mm-hmm. I took bias cut dresses and cut them out of corduroy, so it was like kind of doing the opposite of what it should be. Um, so it kind of works like that, and then it's a kind of an elimination. You, you start off with so much and then you end up with 30 looks. So you, there's so much you yeah, get rid of yeah. through the process. And, and we work usually a year in advance. So like Loewe is, most collections are done a year in advance. JW is about, about nine months. So it, we build the time in. So when I first joined Loewe, I didn't do any output for the brand for a year, just so that I could try to understand yeah. it. Because it. And I think once you build it in, then you can deal with the speed. Because you're, you know, I'm already working on middle of next year. So it's sort of, you're just sort of, and then as things change, then you can just plug and play things into it. But to me, it's like the the most exciting thing has always been the process leading up. And I take complete pride in that process. I feel like Americans are much better at sort of owning it in our world. Yeah, Americans are better kind of of, um, communicating a process or communicating like, to promote something. Yeah, I think, yeah, right. I think ultimately the, you know, I think British people are very good at, do you like it? No, no. (laughs) You know, everything ends in the word no. I'm the worst at it. So I'm like, you sure? Yes. No? No? Yeah, Yeah. okay. And I think there's this sort of uh, apologeticness. So do you ever fully fail? I mean, I guess if you quit altogether, maybe. But each time you maybe fail at doing something on a smaller level, you probably adjust in some way. When I, when I started J.W. Anderson, the amount of times that we nearly went bankrupt was crazy. Um, it was uh, ridiculous. Um, and each time you would get closer to it, then you would shift and then something would work. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, then yeah. you kind of, um, or you change direction. It sort of, yeah. and, and then you kind of learn something from it. And you're kind of like, well, I won't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah. it's a very good elimination tool. Yeah. Um, and I think it, as well, it kind of keeps you real on it. I think sometimes the problem with probably, I think, anything in the arts is there is, um, you can become very detached very quickly. Um, and I think that's to do with speed and and fame, ultimately. And I yeah. rewatched this, um, I, I really love this um, documentary, which, which was done by Scorsese on Franley Brivets, mm-hmm. called Public Speaking. Yeah. And it was interesting how what she had said, like, 10 years before and right now is exactly what was happening. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you know, she talks about, you know, uh, creativity and the connoisseurship and like, and talking about fame mm-hmm. um, and detachment from creativity or, or the idea of the superstar, you know, and she talks about Andy Warhol and how, you know, he kind of made Callie Darling into a superstar, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, but, it, but his whole thing was, it was funny. You know, it was yeah. like this, a bit so dark, yeah. it was dark. Yeah. So there was all these kind of like split realities. And I think what is interesting is in a weird way, when I started to do a lot more looking into Warhol in that moment. Mm-hmm. And in a weird way, where we are is nearly at the tail end of that. It's nearly become this, you know, we, with creativity, you have to kind of make sure that you're grounded in it or you can become grotesque in it. Sometimes I think failure is a very good grounding tool for people Mm -hmm. because I think, you know, it's like nearly like, you know, like when major Hollywood actors do films and they flop and then they suddenly become cult films, you know, Um, you kind of need that to create the cult, you know, because it sort of repositions or, you know, and same as in fashion, anything becomes too popular too quickly, it's over. But also failure is like, that's kind of all part of the process I find anyway. And it's also, again, it's like, it comes back to this feeling of this sense of speed and content. Yeah. That if we're doing, if we're creating, if we're having to create, if we're being forced to create stuff quickly um, and, and routinely in a way that's like pressured, it, uh, it doesn't, A, it doesn't allow for any thought about any failure. Mm. We can't really reflect on mm. what we have failed on. It's like, you know, if, if you're in, in any kind of, any other craft, the the failure failure happens all the time. If you're, I don't know, imagine potters yeah. fail all the time, and and you don't see that process. Yeah. But there's the time to reflect on why that failed and what you learn from it, but also what you can develop and what you can kind of bring out of it. 
And often, like, I've made terrible decisions about characters or stuff that I now can't watch the film or yeah. the series because all I see is failure. Yeah. But I have learned from, like, well, that failed for that character, but what's so cool is that that audacious, outrageous decision I made for that character that doesn't work could work for something else. And then you kind of have the time to think it through and reflect on it. I had a really great bit of advice, which is not, not necessarily about how to get into acting. That's fine. It's my favourite piece of advice. Okay. Um, it's really not that great, but it was to do with um, never going bankrupt, actually. So there was a guy who came to my drama school and told us, he was like this brilliant, this guy that I really loved. He's a, a theatre actor, and I'd seen him do shows at Edinburgh and loved him he kind of, in his 70s and very cool and kind of a cult hero. Anyway. He came in and I was expecting this sort of amazing bit of advice about this is how you act. Yes. And he went, if there's one thing I've learned, and I was like, go on. He said, save half. <laughs> and that was it. And I was like, great. Thanks so much. But that's pretty good But advice. then yeah. I went away and being thoughtful and reflective, went away and thought, um, maybe he's talking about performance. And I've somehow kind of um, mangled his advice and turned <laughs> it into something skewed and what I think is helpful. And that's always about saving half in performance. <laughs> but I don't know if that's helpful or not. That's like the, is it Chanel quote of always take off one thing before you <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, it's a similar yeah. thing. So it's, it yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. that's it works. <laughs> How about you? What's that? How about me? I, I used to, I, I, I had the amazing, um, one of my first jobs, I worked for a woman called Manuela Pavese. And she was the creative, one of the creative eyes of Prada, best friends of Mutual Prada. And um, I remember first starting the job and meeting her and she was this sort of like very short Milanese woman, incredibly well dressed. And um, I was like a complete fangirl with her um, and was like, uh, like shaking while working, doing windows. And, um, and I remember one time, the biggest thing that she had said to me one day when it, something was going wrong is that she was like, you should never compromise ever and she was very kind of like and then I kind of was like well then how do you get forward but then but what I kind of liked was that I think it's like I think what I got from her kind of taking away from that was this idea of conviction mm. you know and I think I think in creativity no matter what it is you have to have the conviction for it you know you have to really um you have to be very kind of set on the target you know, and yes, don't compromise, but dodge along the way. Because I think sometimes the ideas that you have in the beginning or what you're trying to do may sound crazy to people, but in the end, if it's meant to work out, it will work out. Oh, so, and I think, life. you know, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> it's like, for me, it's just like, you know, you know, throw a stone into the, into the future and then go towards it. And yeah. then, you know, if you believe it's going to work, it'll work. My advice is always uh, to people is ask for things. Just ask for what you want. Go for things. The worst thing that happens is someone mm. says no, but you'd be amazed how many times people say yes. Yeah. Mm. And that's always my biggest piece of advice. Yeah. 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 Thank you guys so much Thank for joining you. me yeah. and for joining Thanks. people in their homes yeah. for this talk about creativity. It's brilliant. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you.